Thank you, Tim. Uh, I could I could sit here and and listen to you go on and on and on about me. <laughs> it's an honor to be with the frontline troops. There's just nothing that I can imagine doing that is more enjoyable and fulfilling and stirring to my spirit than to spend a couple days with those that uh, God has called and placed right on the frontier uh, of the work of his kingdom. Uh, I like being this far away from Atlanta uh, because I can, uh, I can be an expert, uh, <laughs> although my one limitation is that I, uh, I have Peggy uh, with me and uh, she has a way of keeping me honest. Uh, uh, so I'll try to be I'll try to be honest with you this time and not uh, and not work uh, not not uh, uh, pretend like uh, I am an expert. Although I want to tell you I have been uh, I have been working in the city of Atlanta for uh, 40 years now, uh, living in the inner city 30 of those years, and so that's been that's been the context of of my learning. Uh, but I want to tell you that the, the city of Atlanta, as well as, as the cities of North America, and, and some that I have been in globally are changing so rapidly, and that urban landscape is changing so rapidly, that uh, if you're an expert today, you'll be out of date by tomorrow. Uh, by the time your book hits the press, it's, it's pretty well moving toward... Uh, being outdated. And so, uh, as much as I would like to be an expert, the best I can do is to share out of my context, my experience, some of the things that I have been uh, become aware of, and, uh, and perhaps that uh, will connect with some of the things that uh, you are learning in your context. Hopefully we can cross-pollinate our learning, our visions, and the fruit of that cross-pollinization can be much richer for the kingdom. The subject that was assigned to me tonight was gentrification with justice. Uh, now that may seem like an oxymoron to some, uh, but gentrification, is that, does everybody know what that term is? Let me see your hands. You know what gentrification does? Most everybody does. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, there wouldn't have been that many people raising their hands. And if you just asked that question in a, in a uh, congregation, there would be uh, a fairly few of them uh, that, would, that would know that. Um, it is by definition, I guess, the, the return of resourced people purchasing property in the city and a corresponding displacement of lower income residents, most of whom are, are renters. So it's a move back into the city by, by the gentry, the resourced folk. Uh, I had never heard that term when uh, we felt called to move from our suburban home and and move into the inner city of Atlanta. That was, that was a, a rather traumatic experience for us. Uh, but uh, God called and we, uh, we felt like we needed to respond and moved into the heart of the city uh, in the neighborhood where most of the kids and families lived that we had been working with. Uh, kids referred by the juvenile court. Uh, and it was, uh, it was against our parents' advice. They said it's a, a very poor decision. Uh, you'll, you'll never get your value out of your property. And, and besides, we're not sure we want our grandkids being raised in that environment. And so with difficulty, we uh, overrode their, their council and moved in to the inner city. We actually... Uh, we're building a new house out in the suburbs, 
and uh, we're actually about five weeks away from moving into it. Uh, when I, I just kept having this growing feeling that God wanted us to do this. And uh, the, the night that, that it came out, Peggy was all excited about uh, the picking out the carpet and the light fixtures and the cabinetry and that sort of thing. And uh, she wanted to talk. And I said, you don't want to talk to me tonight. And she said, oh, no, what's wrong? And that was the first time I came out with this, this admission that I didn't think God wanted us moving farther out of the city, but he wanted us moving into the city. And that, that was a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> and the next morning she said, is it your idea or God's idea? Because it was your idea, I'm not interested at all. And she said, I want to be right. So that was the first time I articulated a seven-page letter, as mm -hmm. best I could grasp, this call of God to the city. Well, the, the, the short story is we got out of our contract on our house and had the financing lined up, so we built a new house, right? Hardly in the city. Um, had been new construction there for probably 50 years or more. Built it on the site of an old burnt down boarding house. And, uh, we didn't do it for economic investment. We did it because that was God's call. And uh, uh, we were able to get uh, a little church up the street that had uh, been abandoned by Presbyterians. And uh, we opened that church, invited the community in, and, and uh, began our new life there. We'd take evening walks around the community. And within the first six months, we started to see some significant changes. Uh, some of the old Victorian houses that had been chopped up into uh, little one-room apartments, that sort of thing, uh, were being bought up and restored to their, to their Victorian grandeur. And uh, then a builder built a, uh, a new, very nice house in the block adjacent to ours. And then another developer came in and built, a, built out a whole block of very nice upscale houses. And we were feeling quite good about this. Now our property value might increase, and it might be a good investment after all. So that was a that was a very positive thing. Uh, but in the in the little church up the street that we were a part of, invited the community, and we started hearing increasing prayer requests, like "Please pray for us. Our our rents have just doubled. Please pray for us." Uh, we got eviction notice, and uh, we're going to have to move. They've, they've sold the house we've rented. And, of course, we did scurry around, and we helped folks find other housing in the community. And uh, then the day came and uh, uh, where uh, uh, Opal Garrett, who lived right across the street from this little church, came in, and she was weeping. And she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, I've been here, raised my family here, and she said, now they've they told me that they're going to sell a house. The city told them to either fix it up or board it up, and they're going to board it up and just wait till property values go up, and I don't know what I'm going to do. For the first time in my mind, it connected that I was having an impact on the very people that I felt called to serve them on. As my property value was going up, so were the rents of those that I was living among. As, as my wealth was nicely increasing, their poverty was deepening in inverse proportion. It was a dilemma. Didn't know what to do. That was my first encounter with gentrification. And for the last 30 years, I have been working in, in, in that and other environments surrounding me to try to figure out, is there some way that this new phenomenon can be redeemed? Uh, by definition, I'll give you the, uh, the old English version, the gentry were the, uh, the folks in uh, Europe, who owned the land. Those were the landowners. And uh, uh, 
if you lived on their land, they were the land lords. That's where that word came from. And so they were lord of everything that went on on their land. And so if you, you lived there and raised crops and you raised animals, uh, you had little cottage industries, that wealth went to the gentry. And so they were the wealth of Europe. Feudal system where the, the, the poor virtually starved on the land. Uh, but all of that changed when uh, some very bright fellows uh, came up with a machine that would, that would spin wool about a hundred times faster than you could spin it on the spinning wheel in your cottage. And they came up with a machine that, a, a loom that would weave cloth about a hundred times faster than you could weave it in your cottage. And so they took these machines and set them up beside the rivers to, to power them and uh, started factories. And folks started moving off the land into the communities that grew up around the factories and the wealth shifted. And so it moved from the land into industry. It was called the Industrial Revolution. And in that, in that process, the industrialists grew wealthy and the gentry uh, disappeared from the landscape until uh, I never even heard the word. I think I, I might have read it once in a, in a European history course. But that word just disappeared until, until this moment in our history. When it's resurrected, coupled with, made, made a noun, gentrification, I guess it's a verb, isn't it? Uh, the return of landowners, the return of wealth back to the cities, into, into devalued places uh, where uh, many, uh, many places have been aban abandoned or buildings turned, uh, torn down. Uh, but you can see the signs of it now. If there's a Starbucks that appears in the neighborhood, you got gentrification going on. Uh, abandoned warehouses being fixed up as lofts, that's gentrification. Uh, old industrial buildings becoming avant garde art studios, uh, fancy eateries in these old downtown, in town areas that have been devalued for years and are, years and are coming back to life. That's gentrification. Apartments, condos, uh, places for the new wealth to come back and take their piece of the city. A fellow by the name of uh, Eric Von Hoffman out of uh, Harvard, we crossed paths some years ago, and in the mid-90s, where I was experiencing gentrification, I said, Eric, is he's studying this stuff. And I said, Eric, is, uh, is that a movement? And he said, no. No, he said, uh, it's anecdotal. You can find incidences of it, but uh, it's, it's anecdotal. When the 2000 census data came in, I called Eric and I said, is gentrification a movement? And he said, no but it is statistically measurable. Five years later, when he came out with his book, I said, is it a movement? And he said, full blown. <laughs> Every city across the Northern Hemisphere and other cities around the world are experiencing gentrification. And I want to tell you, it is wonderful news for the cities. It means, it means that the tax base is coming back. You know, for years, uh, U.S. cities, and I suspect that's true of Canadian cities, uh, the, the inner city was synonymous with all that was wrong. That's a kind of a catch basin of, of poverty. And so we did our inner city ministries in the heart of the city while suburbanization took over. And the shopping malls were built farther out. And and the population, the wealth, started moving out of the city into uh, what we could call a donut effect. The dough is around the edges, and the hole in the middle is called the inner city. Well, that happened in, in all of our cities. 
to the point where some urbanologists by the end of the 1900s were wondering if there was any future for our cities. And I remember the last article that I read on this stuff in 1999 was entitled, Can Our Cities Be Saved? The question was, are, are they beyond redemption? The, the wealth had moved out, the tax base had eroded. In Atlanta, we could not fix our bridges or repair our sewer system. Our tax base was leaving. Well, all that has changed. Gentrification is changing all of that. And it means that young that wealth, young professionals are moving back into the city, and all kinds of positive changes happen as a result of that. Uh, education improves. These are young professionals that insist on quality education for their kids. And if they can't, if they can't get the response from the public system, they'll create other alternatives for their kids. So the quality of education is impacted. Safety increases. These are connected people who know how to get a hold of their city council person, uh, who can get responses on, on police response. And the economy grows. There, there is competition for the disposable income that these young professionals bring back into the city. And so Businesses come in. There's your Starbucks. Want to want to get their market share of the new wealth coming back. In the process, poverty is suburbanizing. As property values go up, folks have to move to where it's more affordable, and so. Uh, where they're moving is into 40-year-old apartment complexes that were that were built when we when we suburbanized when the money left. Those 40-year-old apartment complexes are somewhat threadbare by this time, and so they don't bring the same amount of income as the new the new product. And so folks are finding more affordable places to live on the periphery, on the outside of the in-town areas. Uh, it's wonderful news for the cities, unless you happen to be poor. There is a coming diaspora of the poor. You know that word that the Jews use that to refer to the, the uprooting from the homeland during the Babylonian captivity. There was a diaspora, an uprooting and scattering to the winds. A diaspora of the poor is coming with gentrification. You can't build, it's like a rising tide, you can't build enough sandbags to keep it back. It's inevitable. Fifty years we have, uh, we have created a donut effect and now it's probably going to be another fifty. We're ten into it. Probably going to be another 40 years before the hole in the donut is filled in by the gentry. But it is coming. The question is, is there a way that it can be harnessed for redemptive purposes? What do we do with the opal garrens of this world? Our neighbors who are being priced out of the, of the market for housing and basic necessities. I remember when Opal came into our little prayer group weeping and sharing her concern about her eviction notice. And I remember that I could not sit there and pray with her. There was something inside of me that says that's just, that's disingenuous. You are her problem. You gotta fix this thing. And so I left. I left the prayer meeting. I went up, I got on my phone, and I started calling folks from around the city. Churches, folks that had supported our ministry, and I said, We've got a problem here, and I don't know what to do about it. And the following week, 20 people from that many churches showed up, and I asked Opal to come in. I said, Share with them what's happening. And I said, I'm a problem. 
and I don't know what to do about this. And they said, well, let's look at her house. And so they walked over, went through the house, very, very bad shape, bare wires hanging out of the wall. I remember the, the commode in the bathroom was, was hanging uh, on a rotted rafter. It was just, uh, things were in bad shape, but it was affordable. And they looked over at that house and they said, boy, this would be a bad investment. But at least, at least we should pray about it. That, I thought that might be the end. <laughs> Good Christians say, let me pray about it. But they did, in fact, pray about it. And they came back and reconvened the following week. And they said, let's buy the house. See what we can get. And so we uh, talked with the owner, made him an offer, and bought it. $20,000. And we gave hope of the good news. You don't have to move. We are now the owners of your home. Which, which was good news for Opal, but it was bad news for us because now we were slumlords. <laughs> <laughs> we, we owned a piece of property that had 60-some code violations. Mm. But that group of 20 folks were connected to that many networks of caring people who started to show up around Opal's house and her extended family of faith from all over the metropolitan area convened on her house for about six months. At the end of which time, that house looked like it did in the 1930s. It was mm. Gorgeous. New roof, siding was painted, floors were replaced, new wiring, all the systems were new, it just looked. She never moved out. Everybody worked around her and her family. And when it was all done, that group of 20 had grown to about 150. Wow. And so he said, let's have a celebration. And, and they came together in that little church. And we called Opal in. We sang, to God be the glory. Had her come down front. And we signed over into her name the title to that property. We said, we haven't had to borrow any money. The total amount invested in it is $24,000. We're going to sell it to you at no interest. So her house payment was about half what her rent had been. And now as Opal's property value goes up, as my property value goes up, it's good news. There's something very right about that. It's justice. And that group of 150 folks said, are there other opals in your church? And they said, boy, there sure are. And that started us down a road that our inner city ministry had no intention of going down toward housing. Well, we just had to because gentrification was in our face. It was impacting the integrity of our ministry. It's taken us down a road that has produced literally hundreds of housing units around our neighborhood and the adjacent neighborhoods because the people of faith caught a vision of how to bring justice into a process known as gentrification. And it became good news for the poor. It's like a modern day parable of, of Christ when he said, I come to bring good news to the poor. There's an example of, this is very good news indeed. Justice is being done. What gentrification with justice look like in a gentrifying neighborhood? Food. Food's a big issue. When we, uh, when we moved into the neighborhood, right out my front window, there was a little corner grocery store, and I saw a steady stream of my neighbors going in and out of there. And uh, Peggy uh, asked me, we were there about a week, and she said, no, no, get a get a get on note for us. And I went over and, and came back and gave her a few pennies, and she said, where's the rest of my change? I said, that's it. She said, you're kidding me. And she marched over to that store, and she came back and she said, we'll never buy anything there again. She said, the milk and most of the stuff is just about twice the cost of what I've been paying out the supermarket. 
will never shop there again. And that steady stream of my late neighbors that could least afford high prices for little quantities of, of uh, inferior quality food, that was their only source for shopping. Injustice staring me in the face right through our living room window. Well, I knew some. Guy at my suburban church was a vice president of one of our major chain stores in the southeast, and so I asked him if uh, if uh, they would put a put a chain store, a supermarket, in our community, and he said we'll do we'll do a, a study, and I'll get back to you. And he did a few weeks later, and he said your uh, your neighborhood won't sustain a a grocery store, and I said no, wait a minute. He said. The density in this neighborhood is a whole lot, a whole lot denser than in the suburbs where you're, you're building stores. And I said, as far as I know, everybody has to eat. And he said in a rather condescending tone, he said, you really don't understand our business, do you? And I said, I think you're in the food business? He said, no. He said, no, we, uh, we don't make our money on food. He said, the margins on food are like about 2% profit margins. He said, we make all of our money on all of those non-food items. The alcohol, the tobaccos, the flowers, the cosmetics, the toiletries, the balloons, all of those things, non-food stamp items. He said, that's what all the profit margins are. He said, you don't have enough he said, disposable income in this community. That is, money left over after the basic necessities. He said, you don't have enough disposable income to sustain a grocery store. And I said, well, what would I have to do to get, to get you to locate here? Well, he said, get your disposable income up. He's talking to a social worker, right? <laughs> you know that... Uh, in my community now, there are two major chain supermarket stores competing with each other <laughs> for the disposable income that gentrification has brought back into the community. <laughs> and you know what that means. If, if our lower income residents have been able to remain there, either renting affordably or owning their own homes, you know what that means for them? It means that the poor are getting the best food value in the entire world. We spend less money on our high quality food than any other, any other country in the world. If that benefit can be passed along to the poor, parity is the higher form of charity. They can enjoy the benefits that the culture gives to them. Justice is being done. Education is a huge one. One of our big concerns when we moved into the city was uh, what about our two boys, elementary age boys? Where are we going to send them to school? Uh, Atlanta, does, uh, the state of Georgia has a, a a less than stellar reputation educationally. They usually compete for the bottom of the list on states. Atlanta is well below the state average. It tells you something about the quality of education that's going on in the Atlanta, in, in the Atlanta the city limits. So what do we do with our kids? Well, we knew we wouldn't be involved as heavily in the local elementary school if our boys weren't in there. And so we met with the principal and said, can we, uh, can we uh, see your test scores? Thinking about enrolling our boys, and he showed it to us, and they were abysmal. About the 29th, 30th percentile of national norms. I said, if we, uh, if we put our kids here, can we be in, in the classroom? Can we bring volunteers into the classroom? And he said, how many and how soon? Can we need all the help we can get. And so we did that. 
and recruited uh, recruited volunteers and uh, gave reinforcements to the teachers and uh, I got the Parent Teacher Association uh, re-energized and uh, the teachers were saying, you know, we spend a disproportionate amount of our time um, just with discipline problems in the classroom. We got control issues for some of the kids who are pretty unruly. Anything you can help us with there? Well, we said, let's start a Let's start a program for those kids. Pull them out of the classroom. The principal said, take them down to your church if you want to. <laughs> and so we did. We started a program during the, during the day, read and write arithmetic and athletics. And they got, the, got little suits and they, uh, little uh, athletic suits. And uh, it became a kind of a status symbol to be in the club. Those kids' behaviors changed. They came up to grade, grade level and beyond educationally. And in a year or two, we're able to be integrated back into the classrooms. It gave teachers the freedom to teach. We started a summer program for latchkey kids that uh, teachers spend two months in the fall just catching them up for what they lost over the summer. By the time our youngest, our, our younger child, Jonathan, graduated from that elementary school, a sixth grade, the every standardized test score had risen to the 71st percentile. Wow. Very little change in the demographics of that school, but a whole lot of change in the internal dynamics and the teaching and the inspiration of the school. It dawned on me the power of a little bit of leaven. Now, my kids couldn't raise, they couldn't raise the, the, the curve that high, smart though they were. Uh, <laughs> When we withdrew as a culture, we withdrew our kids from the public system and went to the suburbs to better schools. It was like pulling the leaven out of the loaf. How do you expect the loaf to rise if it doesn't have leaven? And then turn around and blame it. The young professionals that are coming back in have educational values and they will see that their kids are educated well. It's an opportunity to harness them both into the public system that we have as well as we have in the states. I don't know if you have them here, what do we call charter schools? They're, they're publicly funded, privately operated. You can't do it as, as an over church or evangelism thing. There's got to be a little separation of church and state there, but, uh, but it's a creative way to take control of some of the education in a community and raise the standards for all the kids that are there. there and there are uh, other small private schools that are starting up and other parents like, like we were that would have a real heart and mission for the public system. I want to tell you that the quality of education is going up as a result of gentrification. I, uh, I had this view that wouldn't it be wonderful if we could develop a little, a little community where rich and poor, uh, people of different races, could all live together and, and experience a healthy community life right in the inner city. Uh, I've been accused of being a, a, a visionary. Well, this was more like a fantasy. <laughs> but there was a, a piece of property right close to our house that had been vacant and on the market for 36 years. So it tells you something about the desirability of it. The city wanted to use it as a landfill for years and this, uh, that got blocked. But it in Ray was bad land. And uh, I was able to get a hold of that. Some very smart fellows uh, who were supporting our ministry figured out tax ways uh, of making, making a, a good investment tax-wise out of this bad land. And so we took the land and, and uh, the vision was subdivided into, into 40 lots and have little houses and bigger houses and bigger houses all together. One, two, three, one, two, three, right down the street. Uh, and, and have a mix of incomes and have a mix 
mix of races uh, was a wonderful vision. Uh, and I went to I went to bankers in Atlanta, and they they uh, didn't agree with me. Uh, the kindest thing that I heard was uh, naive, uh, absurd was more like it. They said no. First of all, you're not going to get middle-income folks to come in and invest in that neighborhood, particularly beside low-income families. Hmm. That just did not happen. And the property values, those, those small homes will hold down the value and so they won't appreciate. No, it's just, it's a, uh, it's a ridiculous idea. Um, at that same time, I didn't know it, there was, a, there was a young investigative reporter who was snooping around in the lending practices of Atlanta banks. And he found out, uh, through his research, that the banks in Atlanta were redlining. That means, uh, take a map of the city and draw a red line around a certain poor investment area and say, we just don't we just don't lend money in there. Well, that's illegal. Can't, can't do that. Uh, but they were doing it kind of, kind of quietly until this young investigative reporter uh, did an expose. And, and all of the banks were doing this stuff. And as soon as that hit the paper, my telephone started ringing. And they wanted to talk about this innovative idea. It was now innovative. Uh, and the first one of those 20 banks ran together, pulled a, put a, a pool of money together to invest in red line neighborhoods, and we were the first ones to get, we were the only one on the drawing board, first ones to get money coming out of that consortium of loans. They were just delighted to fund our innovative idea. Uh, well, that has been a, 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 like a living laboratory for me. We did, in fact, build out those 40 homes, a third little ones like Habitat would build, another third a special financing, another third conventionally financed. And the racial mix was, uh, uh, was pretty balanced with Atlanta population, mostly white and black, 50-50. And then we had a couple of uh, Hispanics and an Indian person in there, so just for spice. And, and it just, uh, <laughs> that, was our, that was our neighborhood, our living laboratory. And, uh, it has, it has revealed some very interesting data. For one thing, the presence of smaller homes does not hold down the value of larger homes. It's like a rising tide. Those values go up together. Uh, the idea that folks wouldn't want to live in a mixed income neighborhood, that's just not at all true. There are a lot of people out there who see diversity as a good thing. And incidentally, that's an increasing group of people who value diversity and are learning to live with it and enjoy it. The interesting, the interesting interactions between neighbors uh, has just has been fascinating. I'm going to be able to talk with you a little bit about that uh, tomorrow morning. But I, uh, uh, I would say this, that the things that we demonstrated in that little, little demonstration project have informed that we took that same idea of a mix of incomes and took it to a public housing project in our community, uh, a large 600 unit public housing project transform that into a mixed income uh, community, rental community of 50% market rate and 50% subsidized. Uh, and over the objections of uh, some of those who were wiser, uh, we were able to get approval for that. And I want to tell you that that worked. They said you'll never get you'll never get folks who have options to live anywhere to move in next door to low-income neighbors. In fact, uh, that is not the case. If the property is done well, if the amenities are good, if they are up to marketplace standards, 
If it is in close proximity to some of the benefits or the accessibility of the city, no. Folks with resources will move in. And besides, gentrification is a new norm. It's harnessing gentrification. And so rich and poor live side by side, enjoying the same kind of benefits together. That when the poor were in isolated pockets, they were excluded from. This stuff has gotten me into all kinds of areas that I would have no, no interest in or was not a part of my training at all. Changing, changing federal housing policies. Whereas now our housing and urban development that funds our public housing, uh, uh, when I moved into the city, they were only funding poverty compounds. Places for those with the lowest incomes to live. It was an isolation uh, strategy. It was a failed policy. Because of, a, of demonstrating how mixed income community can work, it has changed federal policy until now. They're not funding uh, isolated compounds anymore. They're doing mixed income developments. Every housing project in Atlanta, and we have a lot of them, every one of them has been torn down and replaced with mixed income housing. Where the gentry and those who are struggling live side by side and enjoy the benefits of a reviving community together. Inclusionary zoning, that's something that, that our city never heard about. I never heard about it. But as gentrification is happening, and as the old SRO hotels downtown are being torn down and, and property values are, are going through the roof, uh, it's a heyday for developers when you can get cheap land to do development. But we had an enlightened mayor, a person of faith, who really uh, helped us put this first mixed income public housing project. She said, you know, it just isn't smart leadership if we allow the gentry to move in and it displaces our workforce. Our folks can't, our dishwashers, our sanitation workers, those that make the city run, if they can't afford to live here, that's just not good urban planning. And so she commissioned a group to uh, put together some policy suggestions. Inclusionary zoning was one of those which said to developers, we want you to develop, we want you to put in your condos, uh, but we want you to reserve 25% of those as affordable housing so that the workforce of Atlanta got away from affordable housing. Workforce housing, maybe not. Workforce housing is integrated into the development plan of the city. I had no idea that I would be drawn into this kind of ministry. But it's a part of harnessing the forces of gentrification for the purposes of the kingdom of God so that justice can be done for everyone. I... Uh, I realize that this calls for brand new paradigms of ministry for many, if not most of us. There's a, gentrification is forcing a T in the road. We're coming to a decision point for those of us who have done urban ministries. Uh, what's happening is that the landscape around our ministry centers is changing. The demographics is changing. The poor are getting removed. One of the complaints that I hear most as I, I get around the country and talk to you know, urban leaders, they, there's this tension between uh, the workers and, and the board. The workers say, we need more vans. Uh, we need to keep track of our kids and our families to keep them coming back to the center. And their boards are saying, do you know how much we're spending on vans? Oh, 
spending? Do you know how much we're spending on, on transportation costs? Do you know how much staff time is going into just transportation? Coming to a T in the road, the center isn't holding. Folks are gravitating away from our centers and we're coming to a T in the road. We just can't keep doing business the way we have in the past. Decision time, one by one, is upon us. So what do we do? Well, we go one of two directions. We turn left and we become, call it migrant ministries. Following the migrant streams of the poor as they are displaced from our urban core out to their suburban locations and we become mobile, we rent an apartment or two in the complex and we do ministry uh, and, and keep the, uh, the continuity of the relationships intact. It's a legitimate ministry strategy. It's mobile. Uh, and then when that apartment complex is, uh, is sold and flipped, uh, then we can follow folks wherever they go. Call it migrant ministries. It's a legitimate strategy. The strategy that I have adopted and where I have all of my stock these days is the uh, hanging a right, the other direction, and that is community development, which is developing those strategies that enable otherwise displaced people to remain in the community and become uh, beneficiaries of a reviving, changing community. Now, either one of those calls for a shift in paradigm but certainly the community development direction calls for the greatest change. It means we get involved in real estate. It means we get involved in politics. It means, it means we develop different kinds of partnerships. We gotta get friendly with bankers, with real estate developers, with, with real estate brokers, with lawyers. We've gotta get friendly with them to make partnerships that are redemptive, that enable our families uh, and who we're committed to, to be beneficiaries of gentrification. Um, the greater challenge, of course, is, is community development. And for those of us who have a service orientation, that's our, our DNA serving a particular population. Uh, it means a significant change of, di of direction. It means focusing on a single community as opposed to a single population. Uh, it means focusing on uh, the health of the community rather than simply the health of our clients. It's a shift. And when you're, looking, when you're looking at the world through the lens of community, it's a, it's a much vaster area to, to try to get your arms around. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough to work with a, a struggling population, an addicted population, a homeless population. That's, that's tough enough, that's tough work. But when you put your arms around a whole neighborhood, Boy, there's crime on the streets, there's street lights that need to be fixed, there's, there's schools that need to start edu be educating again, there are, uh, there's a response from city government that uh, needs to be redeveloped, there's, there's developing relationships with developers who have plans for that land. Uh, it's developing uh, task forces or boards of people who, who can look at your neighborhood and ask you all the right questions. In your neighborhood, uh, how many housing units are there? What's the population? What's the demographic of your neighborhood? How many homeowners do you have versus renters? 
Uh, what kind of stores serve your community? And on and on. All of those kind of questions that will require us to be become experts in our community so that nobody knows that community any better than we do because that's our mission, to see the community, the neighborhood transformed. It's very different, a very different approach from a service directed to a target population. I don't know if, I don't know if you do it. It means a whole, it means, it means changing some of the DNA in the Salvation Army. Uh, but, uh, well, you know, a few risk takers, a few creative people, cut out a little space uh, for some <coughs> inventive folk. Uh, you know, a Catholic church is, is genius at this. They got some, they get some rebels in there that they, uh, they're not satisfied. They got a mission to do. Uh, education for the poor, so they just create a special order. You know, okay. On the Franciscans or something. Yeah, just create an order. Maybe we can learn something mm. from that. Um, mercy and justice are they're two sides of the same coin. They're, they're, they're close cousins, but they are very different. Mercy has to do with those high touch, care, bind up the broken, give some food to the hungry, clothe the naked. Those are, those are wonderful, important biblical ministries. And probably nobody does that any better than the Salvation Army. You have an amazing history. But justice, now that's another issue. It's looking upstream a ways and saying how, how these broken folks get so messed up. It's tracking them back into their home situations and finding out what's happening in, in that uh, rat infested place. Why are these kids getting rat bitten and, and, and disease? And it's following them back to their sources. That leads us into justice because that's where we encounter the injustices that have been visited on the poor. You've got an amazing history, though. Do you know, do you know the name Octavia Hill? Let me tell you about Octavia. She was a school teacher in the mid-1800s in London, in Dickens, London, when London was a, uh, was a horrible place. To live. All manner of injustice. The tenements is where the poor lived. Octavia was an 18 year old girl, school teacher, and she was teaching some of the kids in the school there. And some of those children came from nearby tenements. And she was concerned because they came ill clothed didn't have coats in the winter, shoes were worn out, and uh, they slept a good bit because they were hungry. She was concerned, and so she followed a couple of them home one day and saw the tenement where they lived and saw the conditions there and went in and met the children's mother and saw that many of the doors didn't even have locks on them anymore. They'd been broken down. Many of the windows were, were broken out. There was trash and garbage stacked up all over the place. An incredibly inhumane condition for a child to grow up. And this young girl uh, went to the owner, tracked down the owner of the tenement, and she said, I'll make you a deal. Let me move in there. Uh, don't pay me anything for a year, but don't raise rents. And if your property at the end of the year is making you more money, then let's talk about compensation. Deal. One year later, Octavia Hill had organized a residence of her tenant, her, her tenant building, 
They had cleaned it up, they had painted it, they had spent some of the money on fixing the windows and getting security on the doors, they had cleaned up outside, they even planted some flowers and some little garden, and the place, among the tenements at Lyndon Street, the place shone. And the rents, the profitability was greater because it wasn't the constant turnover. She realized that one of the reasons for turnover was the, these guys were having these dead-end jobs. And so she knew an opportunity uh, to get them a stable job, a fellow by the name of Booth, who was starting some factories around there, went to him, said, would you, if we give you support, would you hire uh, these men for my tenant? He did. At the end of the year, that, uh, that uh, apartment was making money, and she, Octavia, went to the, uh, the landlord and said, uh, or the owner, and said, uh, you got another building for me to take over. And he said, sure, I will. And she recruited a girlfriend who moved into the adjacent building. You know that, that by the time Octavia was a mature woman. She had 10,000 housing units all across London under her management. Wow. Wow. She had such clout and power with, uh, with uh, the, the frontline troops, the booths of the world. They had access to parliament. They had access to city government. Laws were changed. Sanitation laws were changed. Housing legislation was enacted. And over a 15-year period, housing conditions in the city of London were absolutely transformed. London moved out of the dark ages and became a, a city on a hill, an example of what a civilized city looked like. They called it the dawning of the golden age. Octavia Hill, one of, one of your folks got that same DNA, heart that loves those kids. She made the decision to plant herself, to locate herself in the middle of need, and as a part of the transformation that took place in a community. Well, I'm, I'm sure I'm way out of time here. One of the problems of gentrification is rising taxes property taxes. There came a day when Opal's property taxes had gone higher than her house payment. She's fixed income. That's not right. That's an injustice. But what do we do about that? That takes, city can't waive taxes, that takes state legislation. Well, who do we know that has access there. I certainly didn't, but there was a there was a lady in my church that said I worked on the campaign of uh, Nan Oruk, state senator. She said I call Nan. Good, do that. <laughs> and so she explained Opal's situation to Nan, her senator, and she said, Oh, oh, that's that's not right. Uh, let me introduce some enabling legislation that will allow municipalities to put a cap on that, folks with mixed income. Went through the General Assembly uh, without opposition. Who would oppose that? Came down to a municipal level and, it, and they enacted it, and now Opal's property values are capped. And the other Opals like her in the city of Atlanta. Justice. Justice. Somebody has to be in touch with those people who, who are the victims of injustice. People of the system who, who have access to the system. <clears throat> to bring about justice. Well, let me, let me finish up here quickly. Um, you know that the whole world's moving to the city. You know that. World migration, unprecedented world migration. Every nation is experiencing <laughs> urbanization, none greater than China. That's right. 
A city of 10 million every month. Can you imagine that? Every month. That's what those numbers look like. Rural urbanization. Uh, we just heard tonight, uh, now half of Canadians live in a dozen cities. Uh, the states passed that uh, several years back. Now 75% of the citizens of the, in the states live in cities. And that number is only increasing. The world is urbanizing. Every gift that Christ has entrusted to the saints is needed at this time of world urbanization. Certainly the gifts of compassion, the loving, the caring, the counseling, the teaching, all of those things, certainly that's important. But there is a, there's an entire strata of gifts out there that are not currently being mobilized. They're sitting in the queues. They're talented people. They've got legal degrees. They're accountants. They're, they're running corporations. They're making laws. They're the folks that are the, the, the tier above uh, the workforce. And they're out there sitting in our pews, hearing good sermons, and every once in a while somebody will come and say, uh, you ought to get involved in a mercy ministry. And so they do. They'll build a habitat house. They'll come down and serve soup in a soup kitchen. Some of them do that. But those kind of service opportunities are nowhere close to their best professional ability. That's right. Nowhere close. The challenge is, how do you hook those talented people up with a vision that is redemptive that will use their talents to do the work of the kingdom? I want to tell you, when it happens, it ignites them. It's like this is what I've been created for. I thought all I could do was run a business and make a profit. No, this is what God has created me to do. I believe that Every gift, lawyering, real estate developing, accounting, as well as those more high-touch ministry gifts, every gift is a spiritual gift under the Lordship of Christ. Given not for our own benefit, but to be agents of transformation, to bear witness to the kingdom, that is here and is yet to come. I got a theology about this. I, you know, it's dangerous when a when a layman has a theology. You know, I, I kind of I read the scripture and I kind of take it for what it says. You know, I don't know how to explain it. When it's, uh, it looks to me like scripture begins in a rural setting, a garden, human history, and it ends in an urban city, mm -hmm. city of our God. As a matter of fact, the final destination for, for the righteous is going to be a city. We're all going to be urban dwellers. And if you want to, if you want to see the description of this place we're heading, just look at uh, sort of the last, last few chapters in the book. It'll tell you about it. It's, it's a city, talk about high rise. This city is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles high. Talk about a high rise. <laughs> diversity, diversity will be seen as a gift. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be gathered together in the city of our God. So, so let's embrace it because we've got to get used to it. That's what we're <laughs> going to live with Amen. throughout eternity. Amen. Now, this is hard for Americans, U.S. folks to swallow. But universal health coverage is coming. <laughs> As a matter of fact, best I can figure out just by reading, reading the book is that it's some sort of herbal medicine. It, said, it says that uh, along this river that flows out right out of the heart of the inner city of, of, the, of the New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, along that river is planted trees that bear fruit every season. Yeah. And, and 
the leaves are for the healing of the nations. That just sounds herbal to me. But, but I, like, I, I'm not theological. A lot of attention given to aesthetics. So if you're one of those kind of people that just, just loves to make beautiful things, just is never satisfied with the way you have the furniture arranged, you're always looking to change the color and plant something new. And if you have if you have a bent toward aesthetics, take take courage, because there's an awful lot of work to be done in the city of our God uh, that has to do with making this place beautiful. Here's what it here's what it says. It ends up the book. It ends up saying. And they, the gifted ones, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now for years I read that, and he shall reign. Obviously he shall reign. But what it says is, and they shall reign. The gifted ones, talented ones. Reign, pick up positions of responsibility over which they have authority. Using their talents in some essential role within the inner workings of this global city to express the full measure of the kingdom of God. Now, here's my theology. I think that God is getting us ready, giving us a trial run for what our final job description is going to be about. I think he's gathering in this moment of history, he's gathering all the people of the world into cities uh, that are growing and uh, we're kind of tearing our hair out on how to, how to stay on top of this thing called gentrification and, and how in the world do we work out reconciliation with all this diversity and all of those complexities that it takes to make a city run well. I think, I think this is our trial run to engage with our God-given talent in the dynamics of our city so that we can bear witness to a kingdom, the foreshadowing of which is here, but prepare for our eternal job description in the city of our God. My theology. I hope when he comes, he'll find us all fully engaged in the city. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.